Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In her article, The Trolley Problem, from Section 5 onward, Judith Jarvis Thompson is going to frame these cases in terms of rights, and she's going to develop a more and more sophisticated analysis of that, pointing out the need to look at important factors and not just generalize from the notion of rights per se. She says that there's two facts about the bystander at the switch, the now familiar version of the trolley problem that you see in most of the memes, where you've got somebody who actually has to pull a switch, which will take the runaway trolley from the track where it's going to run down five people and shunt it onto another track where it will instead kill one. And Thompson says that we, we may do this. This is morally permissible. It's not morally required, but it certainly is okay. In other cases like that of surgeon or the, yeah, transplant or hospital, we, we don't see a similar, you know, it's okay to sacrifice one for five kind of result coming in from at least most people. And she says that there's, there's two important considerations here that have to do with the one case as opposed to the others. Two facts, she says, about which he does what he does, which seemed to me to explain the moral difference between what he does in the bystander at the switch and what the agent in transplant would be doing if he proceeded. In the first place, the bystander saves his five by making something that threatens them instead of threaten one. We're going to come back to that. Second, the bystander does not do that by means which themselves constitute an infringement of any right of the one. And so this is where we want, she says, we want to make an appeal to the concept of a right. And she says, my feeling is that solving this problem requires making appeal to that concept or to some other concept that does the same kind of work. And that's interesting. So she says that in a footnote, I strongly suspect giving an account of what makes it wrong to use a person would also require an appeal to the concept of a right. So even a conscient approach isn't going to do it for her. Instead, she talks about one of the great 20th century theorists of rights, uh, Ronald Dworkin and his metaphor from Bridge, uh, a card game, could equally apply to Pinochle or to Sheep's Head or any other game in which you have trumps. He says, rights trump utilities. What does that mean? So utilities are when we're thinking about the overall distribution of benefits and harms and trying to maximize benefits and minimize harm. So utilitarian reasonings about things that he's just calling that utilities and she follows uh, using that. So she says that is one would infringe a right in or by act. If one would infringe a right in or by acting, then it is not sufficient justification that one would thereby maximize utility. So we can, in fact, maximize utility and ought to maximize utility in most cases unless somebody's right is being infringed thereby. So you could think of this as something that is superimposed upon our normal moral processes of maximizing utility. So if we do that, then we have to look for who has rights. And it seems like in the bystander at the switch, we have a right, don't we? Doesn't pulling the switch infringe on the one workman's right to life? 
You know, it certainly seems that way. And in the surgeon thing, we, we could say the, the right the young man has against the surgeon that the surgeon not kill him, a right in the cluster of rights that the young man has in having a right to life. Having a right to life means having a right not to be killed. Right? So what about this worker out there on the track that you're going to have the trolley run over? And she says, in bystander at the switch, the reason why the bystander may proceed, this is what some people might say, is that if he does proceed, he maximizes utility, he brings about a net saving of four lives, and in so doing, he does not infringe on any right of the one track workman's. And she says, well, is that really the case? Is it clear the bystander would infringe no right of the one track workman if he turned the trolley? Suppose there weren't anybody on the straight track, and the bystander turned the trolley onto the right-hand track, killing the one but not saving anybody, wouldn't that infringe a right of the one workman? What's the, the right there? A right in the cluster of rights he has in having a right to life. So putting five other people on the track that you're going to hit, it doesn't take away that right now, does it? That's a good point. But maybe we could say, well, you know, they're work people, so therefore, there's some sort of waiving of the right to life. They, when they enter the workplace, they know it's going to be a dangerous place, right? Um, she says that we must make room for this possibility of waiving a right and went in that category for the possibility of failing to have a right by virtue of assumption of risk, it might be argued that 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 is exactly what's involved here. The track workmen know the risks of the job and consent to run them when signing on for it. And she says, that's not a very good way of resolving this difficulty. Track workmen certainly do not explicitly consent to being run down with trolleys when doing so will save five who are on some other track. Certainly they're not asked to consent to this at the time of signing on for the job, and I doubt they would consciously assume the risk of it at that or any other time. And what if they're not track workmen? What if you've got, as she says, uh, young children? Or what if they'd been people shoved out of helicopters? Wouldn't it, it, it all the same be permissible to turn the trolley? So this waiving rights, that's not going to work. That's, that's not going to help us here. So she goes on in the next section and says um, that maybe we need to attend to the means by which one kills and saves, not just whether people have rights, not just the decision that's being made. And she says this is where these two crucial facts are important in Bystander at the Switch. We save the five by making something that threatens them instead threaten the one. And we don't do that by means which themselves constitute infringements of the right of the ones. So she said, let's, let's look at this first thing, uh, a little bit more closely. If the surgeon proceeds in transplant, is it the same kind of situation? He is not saving his five by making something that threatens them instead threaten one. They are going to die of organ failure. And the young man who's going to be carved up for his organs against his consent is going to die. You could say, well, it's organ failure. No, it's the organs are actually taken out of his body, producing his death. They're taking his, you know, uh, heart and lungs and, and kidneys. So, yeah, that'll kill you. Right. So it's not like making a trolley go from one track to another or a fire or an avalanche or poison gas that you have to divert from one part of the hospital into another where instead of killing five, it kills one. In this case, the means that kill the person are different than the danger to the other people. And Thompson thinks that this is very relevant. Um, she talks as, as well as where she introduces the case of hospital. There are five patients in a hospital whose lives could be saved by the manufacture of a gas, but this will ine inevitably release lethal fumes into the room of another patient who are unable to move. Um, and, you know, she says we, we can't do that. But if we're dealing with gas that's already in the system, you know, and we have to divert it one way or another, we can do that. So the means are very important. And this this qualification of making something threaten the one instead of threatening the five 
this is, is, is what the trolley case, in her view, is about. And this means that we're engaged in doing something that's a little bit different. She says, what does the bystander do? He doesn't merely minimize the number of deaths that get caused. There's two key things here. He minimizes the number of deaths which get caused by something that already threatens people, and that will cause deaths, whatever the bystander does. So there's, somebody is going to die, no matter what, and the deaths are, you could say, on the same causal level or in the same causal chain, however you want to frame it. This allows, uh, in, in Thompson's view, what she calls a distributive exemption to be made, which permits arranging that something that will do harm anyway shall be better distributed than it otherwise would be, shall do harm to fewer rather than more. And she says, not just any distributive invention is permissible. It's not generally morally open to us to make one die to save five, but other things being equal, it is not morally required of us that we let a burden descend out of the blue onto five when we can make it instead descend onto one. Now, the question that we can ask here is, is this infringing on somebody's rights? Or is, when she says exemption, does she mean, well, they don't really have a right at that point? And we can understand this a little bit better when we think about some of the cases that apply to this, this question of infringing uh, somebody's right. And so this is where she introduces the fat man example. And the fat man, instead of the trolley, you know, being diverted by a switch or the driver deciding on it, you are on a bridge and there's a fat guy watching the trolley proceeding towards uh, five workers, five people tied down to the tracks, and you could push him over. His mass is sufficient that when the trolley hits him, it will stop. But you are pushing him to his death. And she actually considers a couple variations. Well, what if you don't actually push him? What if you just notice that the handrail is kind of wiggly and he's leaning on the handrail watching the trolley and all you need to do is like give the, the handrail a little tap and then it'll, it'll break and he'll fall down. And she says, in these cases, we would say, no, you cannot do that. Why? Because you are using a means that infringe the rights of the fat man. In the one case, the means is you're using the fat man himself as the means to stop the trolley, right? To save the five. And you're, you're using means that definitely infringe upon his right to life. In the handrail example, it's a little bit trickier and, and we'll come to that. So she, she says here, um, suppose the agent proceeds, he shoves the fat man toppling off the footbridge causing him to be hit by the trolley, thereby killing him, saving the five. This agent does so by means that by themselves constitute an infringement of the right of the ones. Shoving a person is infringing a right of his, so is toppling a person off a footbridge. And she says, I should stress that doing these things is infringing a person's rights, even if doing them does not cause his death, even if doing them causes no harm at all. As I shall put it, shoving a person, toppling a person off a footbridge are themselves infringement of rights. Now, if it's not going to cause death, just a little scare, maybe we would say, well, in this case, it's, it's not that big of a deal. But... She goes on and she says, consider by contrast the agent and bystander at the, uh, at the switch. He too, if he proceeds, saves five by making something that threatens them, instead threaten one. But the means he takes are these. Turn the trolley off onto the right-hand track. Turning the trolley is not an infringement of anybody's rights by itself. And this is where she brings up the wobbly uh, um, railing. And she says, what I have in mind is a rather tighter notion of means. By hypothesis, wobbling the handrail will cause the fat man to topple into the track, uh, but the trolley will not threaten him instead of the five unless 
wobbling the handrail does cause him to topple. Getting the trolley to threaten the, fi- the fat man instead of the five requires getting him into the path by whatever means. I mean, you could also say insulting him so that he falls off the track out of outrage and uh, embarrassment would be using a means as well that would produce that, that effect, right? So she goes on and she says, I had a notion of means that comes out as follows. Um, suppose you get a trolley to threaten one instead of five by wobbling a handrail. The means you take to get the trolley to threaten the one include wobbling the handrail and all those further things you have to succeed in by, by, by wobbling it if the trolley is to threaten the one instead of the five. So the means by which the agent in Fat Man gets the trolley to threaten one instead of five include toppling the fat man off the footbridge. This is an infringement, right? She does also clarify what kind of infringement. An infringement of a stringent right of the one or the few. A particularly stringent right, she says. When we say stringent, we mean a right that really has to take priority over others. And so she says, consider a few other cases. What if the bystander at the switch has to cross without permission a patch of land that belongs to the one in order to get to the switch, thus in order to get the trolley to threaten the one instead of the five, the bystander must infringe a right of the ones, may he proceed? Or what if he has to use a sharply pointed tool and the only available sharply pointed tool is a nail file that belongs to the one, here too the bystander must infringe a right of the ones in order to get the trolley to threaten the, the one instead of the five, may he proceed? So he's already infringing rights. These are not particularly stringent, though. She says that the rights which the bystander would have to infringe here are minor, trivial, non-stringent, property rights of no great importance. By contrast, the right not to be toppled off a footbridge onto a trolley track is a stringent right. So there's an important difference between stringent and minor, trivial, non-stringent rights that applies here as as well. And so she says that um, what is at work here is a matter of degree, and it should be no surprise that there are borderline cases on which people do, in fact, disagree. Um, but she goes on and she says, in any case, the distributive exemption that we spoke of earlier uh, is very conservative. It permits intervention into the world to get an object that already threatens death to those many to instead threaten death to these few only by acts that are not themselves gross impingements on the few. That is, the intervener must not use means that infringe stringent rights of the few. So we can use means that do infringe rights of the few. They cannot be, you know, uh, violating stringent rights. And, And this is for her the solution to the problem and the way to clarify how it is that rights come in here, how we should understand them in these tricky moral dilemmas.